Kia ora koutou, ko Tiffany Taku Ingoa, he kairuruku taufainga aho ki Manaki Whenua. Good morning everyone, my name is Tiffany and I am the Events Coordinator at Manaki Whenua Landcare Research. Before I hand over to Hugh, I'm going to run through a couple of technical slides to ensure that your experience with us online today goes as smooth as possible. If you have joined us previously for a webinar session, you can ignore me for the next minute. You will notice you have a control panel at the side of your screen. If at any time this collapses, you can bring it back by simply clicking the orange arrow button. If you're having sound issues and you can see my mouth moving, but you can't hear a word I'm saying, please grab the PDF in the handout section and this has instructions to resolve this quickly. The audio panel is where you can control where the sound plays on your computer. Select the drop down arrow and choose your audio output. During the presentation, you may have questions that you want to be covered in our Q&A session. You can do this via the chat panel throughout our session today. You will notice it is pretty small and it will be hard to read other attendees' questions. Select the pop-out icon on this panel and drag the corner out to make it as big as you want. You can also use this feature if you are having technical issues and ask me any questions. Questions asked by the audience show as anonymous and a green colour in the chat panel. However, please note we will use your name in the Q&A session. If I respond to you regarding a question, this will show as read. Now over to Hugh to introduce you to our third session for the Biosecurity Bonanza series. Kia ora koutou. Hello everybody, I am Hugh Gawley. I'm one of the old guys in our Biocontroller Weeds team and I've been working um, in this uh, science area for around about the last 40, um, nearly 40 years. Um, I'm also here to facilitate this uh, webinar and to handle the question and answer session at the end of this presentation. So um, your questions will come to me and then I will um, um, ask Anna those questions when um, she's finished her talk. So moving on from that, um, I'd like to introduce Anna Podolian, who is originally from uh, Lithuania. So she comes from a, a long way across the world. She's one of our highly qualified uh, scientists at Manaki Whenua at Lincoln, who has been working on developing our molecular capacity with our Ecogene team. So I'm going to hand over to Anna now and take it away. Thank you, Hugh, and good morning, everyone. My talk today is about plant viruses and their discovery in native plants. So first, a bit of an introduction on how I got into studying plant viruses. I'm a molecular biologist by training and completed my studies at Lincoln University in molecular plant virology in 2011. Back then, I was also known by a different surname and my focus was on developing a molecular detection method that would be able to detect and discriminate different members of the Luteoviridae family of plant viruses. I have joined Manaki Fenua Lanke Research as a molecular technician three years ago and now work in the molecular laboratory providing technical assistance on various projects. One of the projects I work on is my very own and I'm here to tell you about it. Most of what we know about plant viruses comes from studying agricultural crops. Majority of viruses that have been studied were from agricultural systems and were causing economic losses. Therefore, the viruses have long had a bad reputation and they have been largely viewed as pathogens. This bias has led to a misunderstanding about viruses and few researchers have looked specifically for viruses that might be, for example, beneficial to their plants or even looked at other plants. It is often wrongly assumed that an absence of visual symptoms indicate, indicates a lack of virus infection. But now we know that the virus infection in wild plant populations are frequent and often asymptomatic and are easily overlooked. It is also known now, now that certain plant viruses can increase plant's tolerance to temperature and moisture. The first evidence of plant viruses not being entirely bad, even in agricultural systems, was published in 2008. And by 2011, there was enough evidence for a review article in Nature 
describing that plant viruses can play beneficial roles in plants, especially in extreme environments, bathe the tolerance to drought, cold or hot soil temperatures. And then with advances in sequencing technology, the plant virus discovery really took off. Many novel viruses have been discovered in domestic and wild plants. Furthermore, metagenomic studies have shown that viruses are abundant in wild plants, and these are generally asymptomatic. And now it is wildly accepted in scientific community that rather than being entirely pathogenic agents of destruction, viruses have likely been performing key ecological functions in global ecosystems since the beginning of life. In New Zealand, a new virus has been recently discovered by Robin McDiarmid's group at Plants and Food in broad-leafed dog, uh, Rumex, Rumex obtusifolius, which is a cultivated crop. Arnaud Bloa is the first author on this paper. He has developed a new virus detection method. The majority of plant viruses have an RNA genome, which is a single-stranded molecule. When the virus replicates, the second RNA strand is synthesized and DNA, RNA becomes temporarily double-stranded. Then an antibody specific to the double-stranded RNA is added, and in this way, virus RNA can be enriched and then sequenced with the next-generation sequencing method. This double-stranded RNA enrichment method developed by Arnaud has also detected several already known plant viruses in New Zealand native ornamental plant, Renga Renga, as well as in Mari potato. So, encouraged by the potential of this method, I asked the question, are there any viruses in New Zealand iconic and native plants? I started with four native New Zealand species, Brachyglottis, Lophomertus, Manuka, and Veronica, also known as Hebe. And I did find a new strain of already known virus called Agaratum latent virus. It was found in only one of the four plant species I've chosen in a symptomatic Veronica plant, which is a native New Zealand woody shrub. This virus, Agaratum latent virus, was previously reported from Australia, from Agaratum hostonianum weed and a swan plant, but not reported outside Australia. Both plant species are common in New Zealand, including Lincoln, where I collected my plants. I tested four more Veronica plants around Lincoln, and three of them had this virus. So it looks like the virus is high incidence. So three important results are, first, this is the first record of Agaratum latent virus in New Zealand. Second, this is the first record of any virus found in native Veronica species. And third, this virus is quite common. Agaratum latent virus belongs to the Euler virus family of viruses, and its genome consists of three linear single-stranded RNA segments. Agaratum latent virus genome encodes five proteins. The first RNA segment encodes a replicase, a protein assisting with virus replication. The RNA2 encodes two proteins, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that synthesizes new RNA copies of the virus genome, and protein 2B that is thought to be involved in suppression of RNA silencing and in cell-to-cell -cell movement. The third segment encodes movement protein and the code protein. Now, although the full sequence of each RNA strand is not long, less than 4,000 nucleotides, it was quite challenging to sequence it, and we only managed to obtain partial sequences of each RNA strand that here are shown in green. But there is enough evidence to say that this is a new strain of agaratum latent virus. To compare how closely related two proteins are, we compare their amino acid sequences. And for four proteins that we have genetic information for, the amino acid similarity is above 85%, which is quite high for viruses. 
for any other living organism, 85% amino acid similarity across a genome would definitely mean a different species, genus, or even family or order. But for viruses, it's not considered to be high enough. And for Iller viruses in particular, there are no official species demarcation criteria so far. Therefore, we concluded that the virus was found is a strain of agarotin latent virus and not a new species. Now that we have this virus, more questions emerge. There are a few things to investigate. First, it is very likely that the virus jumped from agaratum or swan plant into Veronica. We do not know if agaratum latent virus causes disease in Veronica plants. What other plant species this virus infects? We don't know, but we have not found it in Manuka, Lophomyrtus, and Brachyglottis, as well as two more Veronica species, although I tested only one sample per species. How long ago did virus switch the host? Why there are no symptoms? And is this virus in any way beneficial to Veronica? There is an increasing number of reports of plant viruses as mutualists, which can provide benefits to the host plant. These mutualistic interactions challenge the traditional dogma that all viruses are pathogens. With Next generation sequencing, viruses can now be discovered in asymptomatic plants, some of which are known to science, like this one. But how to treat new discoveries is a complicated question. There are several published recommendations that were put together by the MPI and plant virologists that outline the ideal response to such a discovery. First, comprehensive inventories of plant virus diversity are essential. That means knowing what plant viruses already exist in a country and which viruses pose a risk to native flora. For a very long time, the major problem was that the detection methods were not sensitive enough. But with new technologies, methods are now too sensitive, discovering more than we know what to do with. So with, dis with discoveries like that, it is very difficult to say if a newly discovered virus is a new organism or not. And without answers to questions about its real distribution, pathogenicity and evolution, it becomes impossible to tell. We did not know that virus was in the country. So do we treat it like a new organism, even if that virus is and was a part of a healthy ecosystem? We accidentally found it in one species, but it, may, might, but it might be present in many others. The virus appears to be asymptomatic in Veronica, but under extreme conditions, it might become more pathogenic or become beneficial. Will it ever pose a risk to Veronica or other native species? At this point, we don't know. And we would not have a clue about this virus if not for this accidental discovery. So how many more plant viruses are waiting to be discovered in New Zealand plants? Another published recommendation is to determine the ecology of known and new viruses, existing and potential new plant hosts and vectors, and develop host virus pathogenicity prediction tools, which is a massive task. And for this project, and, and this project took one very small step in that direction. It obviously demonstrated how much is there yet to be discovered and how much collective effort it requires. So that concludes my talk and I'd be happy to take any questions. Back to you, Hugh. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. That was very well presented um, and really interesting stuff. So um, I, I wondered about whether are there um, uh, are there viruses which are significantly beneficial in our native plants to prevent um, herbivory by insects and things? Um, at this point of in time, we don't know much at all about what is there in our native plants. There could be viruses, and um, part I started this project because I was really interested in exactly application of these beneficial functions of the virus. So right now the answer is we don't know what's inside our native plants at all. 
And the cool. point of such of projects like that is to have a complete inventory of what is out there and what, how can we utilize the functions that this virus can provide to do biocontrol, for example. Excellent. Okay. There are a couple of questions. So um, there's one here from um, Murray Cave. Um, is there potential to identify viruses that could make native plants unpalatable to grazers, such as feral goats or deer? Um, it's a very good question. Um, and, and again, it, it, it goes back to the same problem that we don't know what's out there. Once we know what we can work with, then we can potentially select for viruses. Um, uh, and some, and depends on the conditions, you know, most of the viruses um, that have been discovered, they've been living in the symbiotic, in, 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 in plants with not, not doing any damage to those plants, but under extreme conditions, when there is uh, extreme drought or, or diff drought or different soil temperature or um, rain periods, those viruses it look like they provide additional advantage to the plants. So we don't know yet. <laughs> it's, it's, it could be. It, it's such an interesting angle to explore this subject. This the subject. Um, the, the, yeah. yeah it, um, certainly sounds like it. I mean, it's kind of interesting. There's a lot of work being done on endophytes and plants and how they tend to make plant material. You know, plants unpalatable to um, to insects and things but until you know what viruses are out there and mm. what the potential is for them to have those impacts we are unable to actually deal you know look into those aspects but it's a fascinating yeah. science here yeah we know a lot of about pathogenic viruses and that the bias and uh, because it, we've been only studying the viruses that are causing problems <laughs> and that's why we have this um picture in our head the viruses are bad and maybe in, in the recent months it was a, another ex example of another bad virus but <laughs> um, but there's like with bacteria there are beneficial good bacteria and bad bacteria so our viruses and we need to understand them better okay cool um, another couple of questions but the next one here from David Britton uh, is how hosts specific do plant viruses tend to be? Um, generally speaking, not um, um, lots of plant viruses are transmitted by insects. So a lot of specificity uh, tends to mirror vector specificity. So if the vector doesn't go to a particular plant, it's less likely that virus will occur in there. Um, so it's quite often mirrors virus specificity, uh, mirrors insect specificity, uh, vector specificity. But um, some of some of the viruses just live in one one species, and they just prefer that particular species. Yeah. So do you, um, do we know enough about sort of viruses to be able to because I know that you can end up getting sort of strains of fungi and bacteria and things that can become highly specific. Um, is that possibly true about viruses as well? Do we have the technology to be able to identify um, highly specific strains or types of viruses or do they still tend to be somewhat blanket species? Um, Did I make that question clear? I may not have done. Sorry. Can you can you reframe it a little bit, please? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I just wondering. Um, so the molecular techniques um, are they sensitive enough to be able to determine one virus uh, strain or species from another? Um, so with molecular techniques, we can sequence, but just looking at the sequence with, without knowing the relatives or other relatives of the same virus, it's very uh, it's not so straightforward to say uh, with mammalians, like with other species, we have some demarcation criteria that if, you know, nucleotides um, 
there is a certain similarity in sequence and we can say for certain it is a different species but with viruses especially with other viruses scientists can't make their mind yet to officially state when is the virus is a new species or or is it the same isolate or it, do they even belong in the same group or not uh, and viruses are much more diverse than any other group um, um, so we we can identify the sequence but it's not often that we know what it means <laughs> unless we have enough information to compare that sequence to cool okay um, looks like the uh, last question we have here is from Robin Shea. Um, could there be speculation as to whether more viruses will appear as climate change progresses? Well, it, it, again, it's linked to the vectors quite often. So if we start getting different insect species, um, those insect, new insect species can carry new viruses. So that's one route of new viruses coming in. Another thing is that some viruses, they are happily living in plants and nothing, um, and you, people can't even tell the plant has a virus. But if condition changes, virus has like three possibilities. It, it can still be invisible and, and do nothing to a plant. It can be beneficial to a plant, as some research has shown, or it can become really bad and, and ugly and start causing damage. So in that way, we will see, we might see symptoms that we weren't aware before of, but it doesn't mean it's a new, new, new virus. It might have been there for a very long time. It's just under other conditions. We just couldn't see its effect on the plant. Excellent. Thank you. So we've had another question come in from Graham Anderson. Do we know what controls replication of viruses and plants to keep them at a, at a stable level? Um, there is a, uh, plants have their own version of immune system and um, there are certain enzymes that recognize double-stranded RNA and, uh, and chop it up. So usually it's um, one of the systems how plant controls virus infection but viruses are really inventive and their ways of um, circumnavigating uh, like escaping um, any controls that plant plant can can invent and because viruses can migrate between plants and fix their bits of genome um, plants have sometimes have really hard time trying to adjust this to this new new combinations and strategies that virus just viruses have so there are controls but they are not very effective and they have to be updated it's the same okay. as with animal viruses I guess. cool okay so we've had some more questions come in you you're um the more you're saying the more questions that we're <laughs> getting so that's really cool um so uh from Claire Woolridge Way, are viruses vector specific? That is, if we have a biosecurity incursion of a new sap sucker, could they then move stable or passive viruses to new hosts? Some viruses are vector specific and they have to pass through the vector entire body in a special way to be transmitted. Some are just a, work as a contaminated needle um, in, in that way. So uh, they just stick to, to insect park, part and get transmitted. So they are not vector specific. And it's vector transmission, insect transmission. It's not the only way that viruses get transmitted. It can be by pollen, it can be by wind, it can be lots of other, other ways that viruses get transmitted. So it's just the more obvious and I guess one of the best studied examples of how vectors can be transmitted is uh, how viruses can be transmitted is by insects. Yeah, but it can be either specific or non-specific transmission. Okay, um, another question from uh, Katharina Tawari. Um, when research into native plants and their symbiotic life with insects, bacteria, and viruses etc is done what sort of protocol is followed in order to honor y262 the treaty of waitangi 
and the input of tangata whenua? That's a complicated question. It is quite a complicated uh, question. Yes, um, I don't know if I can answer it right now, uh, but I can investigate and get back to Katarina uh, more specifically on that. Uh, but I guess we can act and, um, and, and put certain procedures in place once we more know more about the viruses and native plants. So far, we know very, very little. So how do we go about it? It's a bit unclear at this stage, I guess. Um, it's so much more to be needs to be discovered and, under and understood on what it means. Um, is it, yeah, is it, is it a, a part, a, a natural part? If it's a natural part of an ecosystem, then it probably should be treated the same as other native plants. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, not, not, not the easiest questions to answer along yeah. those types of lines, for sure. Um, another question from uh, Graham Burnup. It looks like this might well be the last one. Um, so from Graham Burnup, is it possible that viruses which are highly pathogenic on a particular plant host are asymptomatic and mutualistic on other hosts? Yes, totally. Yes, absolutely. And that's the problem that they can... In, in, a species, a certain plant species, certain climatic conditions, you can see the virus change the host species, change the some conditions, and it becomes invisible. Yeah, that's how we discovered it. So some lots of viruses are being known viruses are being discovered just because they are in the species and in the plant, and um, and people didn't know about it but the conditions change and they start seeing symptoms and it's actually the virus that was already known and just always been there. So it's a nice, easy question to answer. Um, I have another one um, here, one that's just come in from uh, Sarah Moylan, um, which is another question around um, relationship between um, native plants and Maori knowledge and things. So, have you considered talking to Māori about their knowledge of the pathogens that they will have seen and know about in the native plant species? I um, thank you for that question. I haven't um, haven't talked about it yet. It's actually my first year into this research, <laughs> and thank you for the suggestion. I, I will definitely um, contact and, and see what um, what can be added from my my research and develop sure. relationship. Yep. Yes. It's just very fresh, fresh results, very fresh, just out of the lab. <laughs> it's it's fascinating stuff. Um, yeah. So yeah, I um it is it is really fascinating stuff and as you say it's very new stuff as well. So um hmm. you need to, um there's an awful lot of work to be done about viruses. We certainly have hmm. issues with viruses and insects that I have to deal with as well. So Excellent, Anna. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, there appears to be no other questions. So um, thank you all for your um, attendance and um, thank you very much to Anna for a great presentation. It was my pleasure. Thank you.